This video is sponsored by Hunter Killer. Ooh. I think it's fair to say Pixar is very much the top tier animation studio in the 3D animation business. They're the cream of the crop, always pushing the most powerful machines to produce the best aesthetic technology can design. And their stories oftentimes are groundbreakingly original and heartwarmingly visceral. But sometimes they're not always a winner. And though all sorts of Pixar films will have some defenders on the less popular ones, I'm sure, Pixar's first big stumble took place 16 years into their runtime at the opening line of what became Pixar's phase of sequels. And that is, of course, with the 2011 follow-up that was Cars 2. I know people who are absolutely rabid about the Cars franchise, but even they despise this middle child. I, meanwhile, have never seen it. So with it literally now being 10 years old, let's put the pedal to the metal and revisit the stalling misfire that is Cars 2. But while this might not be such a great story, let me tell you about Hunter Killer. The box subscription murder mystery. When Beth Ferris Hendrick's death is declared an accident in the small town of Mallory Rock, Maine, her sister Gwen sets out to prove Beth was murdered. To catch the killer, Gwen will need your help to uncover the secrets that exist on Mallory Rock. Or at least that's at least one story you can gather. And they're not all subscription based. There are all sorts of all-in-one experiences too, if that's more your thing. So grab your favorite crime-solving partner and solve a murder mystery. Each episode unveils an ongoing narrative as you sift through documents, audio recordings, case files, and murder weapons. Like an escape room straight to your door. You can also join the spoiler-free community numbered over 100,000. And having received a couple boxes myself, it is quite the immersive experience. I mean, of course it is. You can poke the evidence, literally. So if you want to try stories in a whole new format, then you can go to hunterkiller.com forward slash daz for $10 off your purchase. That's like a 40% discount off a monthly subscription. So again, make sure to use daz for a $10 discount and find out if you have what it takes to hunt a killer. And now back to a less impactful storyline. There's a running theme with Pixar sequels that are all about the secondary character. And it's the same here, everyone's favorite idiot mater. But we don't actually start that way. Instead, we get this guy, Finn McMissile, on a boat? And there's a warship boat with a gun? This really isn't a racing movie anymore. So Finn sneaks onto this oil rig in the middle of the night and has magnet tires now, so we can just ignore gravity apparently, and a tightrope that somehow can be balanced on perfectly. Actually, it's an incredibly creative way to expand the car's universe, but it also kind of takes something away from the idea, you know? So anyway, this is your standard spy movie opening. Bad guys are doing something suspicious. Agent Leland Turbo. What is it with Pixar showing mutilated cubic corpses? That is dark. But the reveal of Finn's shadow is actually something I really, really like. And so Finn dashes out of there, murdering as he goes. That That's more body parts in this world. But the cinematography is good in places. And then he becomes a boat himself. So why did he need the other guy before? One less impactful version of that dash scene later and the prologue is done. Who can stop us now? Mater. Tow Mater. That's who. That's really forced. So Mater's towing this guy when he spots McQueen's back. This goes on for a while. McQueen's back! McQueen's back! McQueen's back! McQueen's back! McQueen's back! And so the two hang out for the day. All with clips I've somehow seen before through osmosis, I guess. Until McQueen says he wants to spend a quiet dinner with Sally in the evening. And that makes Mater sad. Is this really a plot point? Dude can't stomach McQueen spending time with literally anyone else. So he doesn't. We've seen this cliche before. I'll have my usual. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what? I'm gonna have that too. But hey, I like that joke. So then as these cars drink some alcohol, we learn of billionaire Axelrod, who's pushing for new renewable energy. Nobody will ever go back to gasoline again. This film's not gonna age well, is it? And then there's Francesco Bernoulli, egging on how McQueen would lose to him in a race. Let's go to the phones. Baltimore, Maryland, you're on the air. Have you ever had a dream that you... you had your... you... You could, you'll do, you, you want, you, you could do so, you'll, you'll do, you could, you, you want, you want them to do you so much you could do anything. And of course, Mater then goes running his mouth down the phone too, and then McQueen just abandons his date plans to see the ruckus. What? He's nice to look at, you know, open wheeled and all. <sighs> this is going to be her whole character arc, just thirsting for someone else. All that foundation from the first film, poof, 
Anyway, McQueen hops in and joins the tournament and has to bring Mira along as well. Time for a montage. And some visuals that don't make sense. Planes with empty innards for the cars to peruse around in? But hey, the lighting's nice. Hey, lightning, can you believe this party? And this is actually a really cool sequence of real drivers, and it changes with every region. I'm really out of the loop on IRL car stuff, but this seems really cool. Mayda then goes on to make a fool out of himself at every turn, not understanding another country's culture, as well as putting himself right in front of everybody. This is gonna get annoying. Meanwhile, there's the spy plotline. Finn McMissile meets with Holly Shiftwell, the nerds of an American spy who is here to share information. You know where this is going. This trip's been amazing. Ah, he's a little excited, isn't he? This is so classy. And so everything culminates in the bathroom. Why are there normal sinks when everybody's designed like a car? Anyway, this is our American spy, and he's dead. Dropping the info onto Mater as he eventually drives away. Mater's now accidentally plucked as the spy. Look out, lady. Mater's sitting to get funky. Is this sentence implying what I think it does? Was he literally just swinging around his dick? Anyway, of course he passes the spy code word because the interaction is a real fact, rather than nonsense from both parties like it usually would be, and away we go. Holly plans a rendezvous point and Maida thinks it's a date. Speaking of a date, you, me, the subscribe button, press it, hit the bell, check out all of my other links as well. It'll be our little spy secret. Yeah, that's on theme enough. As for the real spy plotline, our American spy is captured and we're told that the clean energy is actually dangerous with an electromagnetic pl yada yada. The baddies work out they actually want Mater, and as for the spy... This is so dark. And then, 30 minutes into the movie, we're finally at the races part of this racing franchise. Gotta love there's a car there called Daryl, and it's an adaptation. There's dozens of us. And there's like a brief moment of Francesco interrupting McQueen's iconic monologue. I am speed. <laughs> really? You are speed? But then it just goes to normal cinematography again. Where's the flair? Where are those iconic moments from the original cars? Like, even the opening of this movie is just kind of flat in comparison, you know? Like the director just phoned it in for the sequel. So as the race goes on and Francesco regains their lead after bad times in the dirt, the electromagnetic pulse camera comes into play, targeting races and sabotaging the match until they spot Mater and all pile in on him. Uh, so what comes next is Holly starts to communicate with Mater to warn him, right? In response, he just full on continues to ramble down the line to McQueen and her, already grossly unprofessional, but then as a friend, just goes on to leave McQueen during his big race for what he believes is a simple date. For someone prowling around with the best friend label, this comes off as not just dumb and annoying, but incredibly, incredibly selfish too. How do we not talk about this? The other spies perfectly protect Mater in the back alleys and McQueen apparently will accept any orders from Mater despite probably knowing better and losing the race because of it. Ending in the most ridiculous presentations of realism. And also, Finn can hop onto walls, apparently. McQueen is understandably livid and banishes Mater away. Are we seriously supposed to feel bad for the character who we cringe at for making all the wrong moves? Either way, he's the protagonist for the next hour, so get used to it. Finn McMissile detours him away, and after a pretty basic chase sequence through the airport, Mater is taken away on a spy jet plane. They witness the insider information of the big baddie, and Mater makes a contribution. Well done, Mater. I would never have seen that. You never would have thought to look in the corner? Anyway, we come to France, where there's tiny planes replacing birds? What? And hey, Ratatouille, huh? All of this for a scene with an informant to tell us the baddies are all poor quality cars and have a meeting soon. And this scene isn't even interesting. It's just your exposition spy drama. A lot of dialogue and little interesting direction. Cameras slowly moving for no reason, no cars moving around, it's just... Eh. But at least there's buttons for tires to maneuver holograms, and what a coincidence, the meeting ground is in Italy, at the next race! And speaking of threading things back to McQueen, he is sad about the Mater thing. He's my best friend. Then why would you ask him to be someone else? Uh, because he was being inappropriate and ignorant, and at the very least needs to be taught some things, or given assistance if it's a bit more complex than that, you know? Anyway, that's McQueen's bit done. There's essentially no arc with him here, so back to Maida! Yay. Now being given a disguise, where he proclaims he likes to keep every single dent as a memory of his friendship when he got them. This scene? 
ain't so bad. Heartwarming in message, and there are plenty of visuals to see for what is another exposition dump. The Pope is a car. There's canonical Catholicism in this car cacophony culture. And assassination attempts must be canon too in this history. It's time for our second race. Francesco almost does a new twist, no longer throwing insults and talking about homesickness, only to turn it into an insult, a more emotional one, I guess. Also, his mama has hair, as is a reference to the car model they're based on. I'm sure there's way more car trivia sprinkled into this film, but this is all I know. That's some smart adapting there. And they're off. But first, we got the Mater stuff again. Finally, as he's about to take on his disguise, Mater learns about how much of an idiot he is and how much everyone's been laughing at him as the fool, all explained by Finn thinking it's a bit. And then he's pushed in. But I guess that makes sense, seeing as how you wanted in France and Germany. Mater, stop and it! He's so good. <laughs> I'm a little ashamed that I actually kind of laughed at that line execution. Maybe that's what this film needs, bumping up the humor of it all. Make Finn seem dumb in how he doesn't recognize it. Cause every other attempt is just not fun to watch. All of these jokes are really flat. So big boss video calls into the meeting. Do scramble with that voice. I'm trying. Oh, it's too sophisticated. Uh huh, that'd make the plot go by too fast, wouldn't it? Same as if the real American spy showed up. Expositioning the plan, they're sabotaging clean energy in order to bring everyone back to gasoline, which they can now dominate with their newly found untapped oil reserve, the largest in the world. And finally, the spies actually notice the electromagnetic camera ploy, because they could just recognize electromagnetic pulses now, but not last time. But they're caught, and a mild pile-up takes place. Seriously, we've got mutilated corpses and detached body parts, but a large-scale crash looks like this? Bumper cars? Come on. McQueen wins the race, that's probably pretty crushing on home turf, and they only now realize the pileup. Is this a moment of solitude for the two of them as they see the bigger picture? No. But we're not there yet. McQueen still decides to stick with all in all despite the politics as he wants to trust his friend who says it's safe, so the baddies now plan to kill McQueen outright. The last all in all supporter. Dead gum. Gatling gun. Request acknowledged. Shoot, I didn't Request mean. Request acknowledged. I kinda like this. But now Mater has all sorts of over-the-top mobility options, with his hook and his other type of shoot. Not that it gets him very far. Time for Mater in the Void. Finally seeing his memories is embarrassing. There's not really a reaction here, just kinda another angle. It's almost like a behind the scenes of an animation. And then we wake up inside of London. Inside Big Bentley. Where's the Bentley bit? It's time for the final race. Gotta love that London has just grey weather everywhere. We're not in Porta Corsa anymore. And so with front row seats, made us there to see as the Queen is targeted and nothing happens. The plot demands it. But there's a baddie backup plan, a bomb in the pits. Not sure how it would sell the all in all narrative, but sure. Only now does Mater realize he can release himself and off he runs to save the day as a lowly tow truck. Being killed by a clock <laughs> gives a whole new meaning to your time has come. Are these meant to be ha ha he he jokes? Like actually out loud? Anyway, the two escape themselves and spot a Mater piece on the floor. Just left there? The writers really are just phoning it in, aren't they? Oh, and also, Done. Oh, Miss Shiftwell. The standard issue now. Then why didn't you do it before? Mater tries to vacate the pits only to hear that he has the bomb, and McQueen's just spotted him. Leading to this stupid sequence, Mater is reversing onto the track and McQueen is chasing after him. And still far behind, despite literally being the fastest car. I'm the bomb! Yes, Mater, you are the bomb! That's what I'm trying to say here! Ugh. <sighs> And then Mater activates his rocket boosters, and this plot has really just crashed and burned at this point, hasn't it? And Cars 2. Just blasted away. The bomb is now out of range. Time for the spies to hit up all the loose ends. I guess? Again, I found one joke I like out of 20. It's this line delivery from Francesco. What is happening is a bad dream. What is happening? I need more freak out or something. I don't know, funny stuff from the not comic relief character. That's not just, why are you so dumb? So anyway, wrapping up, Finn grabs onto the professor last minute, coming to this confrontation. That's actually quite good. The warship guy is here, magnetizing the professor, disarming Finn, and he's got his weapon aimed on him. That's a great counter movement to have to work against. The answer's pretty basic though. Finn has super card jumping powers, as we've seen before, and uh, bombs that we don't even see the result of. Great. 
Meanwhile, after finally stopping, Mater's bomb starts actually ticking, and they get surrounded. But now, suddenly everyone and their mother is a great fighter. Even Mater himself can just randomly karate himself out of a dilemma. Dude punched his tow truck clone into oblivion. Where did he go? But that's the goon sorted. Uh, I know what needs to be done. Then do it. I can't do it. Look, nobody takes me seriously. What? At every moment up to this point, you've not lingered on this thought to stop an idea, but now you do? This plot is so ham-fisted, man. All to lead McQueen into his counter monologue. Look, you're yourself in Radiator Springs. They need to change, not you. Again, this is nice, but also kind of toxic in a way. It's good to take note of your surroundings. Don't be ignorant and oblivious if you can help it. And then they do the you're the bomb joke again. Invigorated with motivation and a new banjo rendition of the same spy motif we've been hearing practically on loop this entire movie, Mater now bursts into action with all of his gadgets up and over to the queen? Just to... Bomb! Mr. Ah! Bomb! Everybody down! Yeah, why are you telling her? Anyway, this all comes to a head as apparently Mater has finally clicked on who the big, big bad guy is. It's him. Oh! Already? Have you not heard of suspense? Wouldn't that make this reveal way more interesting? Yep, time for the explanation. After. No real climax of this story at all, just more exposition. Axelrod didn't switch to clean, they're faking it, purposely shooting down their own brand for their bigger investment. And what's the big finale sequence I said Pixar movies always seem to perfect first and work their way backwards from? Someone do something! Deactivate! Bomb deactivated. And that's it. No emotional swing, no real daring stakes. You know where it's going, and you've seen it before. Everyone's happy, Mater is officially knighted, we learn McQueen was given organic hippie fuel rather than all in all. Kinda just jammed that in there, didn't they? And the final, final race happens in... Radiator Springs, of course it does. So, he's not so good looking. I'm serious! <laughs> That's why I love you, Sally. For lying? Huh? And it all ends with Mater keeping those jets, destroying the beginning guy's undercarriage, and just destroying the sanctity of this whole racing element. And that was Cars 2. It's just... meh. Everywhere. From the visuals when we've not got rain, to the direction, the dialogue, and the plotline, the jokes. It's cliched, it's not iconic at all, and just kinda phoning it in. Not to mention, it just expands the Cars universe in a weird way. Why is it Radiator Springs has car-themed houses and land built like it's a society of cars, but everywhere else is so glaringly human? Do cars seriously live in these kind of French apartments? No! The film's not thought out like that, and the only impressive part is the faithfulness to real-life car stuff and references to them. But this would only be the start of Pixar's misfirings and the first step into their phaser sequels. Thankfully, they seem to have stepped back on the Cars front, making Cars 3 another personal story, or so I hear. I think I'm gonna spend some time watching that now to clear my head. For now, my name's been Daz, you didn't really care, and I'll see you in a bit. These damn fireworks, man. Record.